Welcome everybody to tonight's lecture. We're gonna give it a few minutes as folks join us. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So good evening. My name is Judy Postmas. I'm the Dean of our School of Social Work here at the University of Maryland. And I'm so pleased to welcome all of you joining us online this evening, even though it's not dark yet, <laughs> for our 24th Daniel Thurs Social Lecture, Social Justice Lecture. Welcome alumni, current faculty, staff, and students. Particularly, I also want to welcome all members of our broader community as we seek to work side by side to improve all areas of social justice. I am particularly pleased to celebrate this evening's Thurs Lecture, which focuses on how organizations in our Baltimore community understand and respond to violence and their efforts to prevent, intervene, and heal our community. Tonight, we are here to learn from our Baltimore community organizations working against violence and towards a more safe and just community. Our speakers include Reverend Corey Barnes from Grace City Church, Mr. Kia Jones from Baltimore Ceasefire 365, and Mr. Kelly Sparks from Sons of Phoenix. The Daniel Thur Social Justice Lecture Series is an integral part of that commitment. Dean Thurs was a social work scholar, leader, activist, and dean, and this lecture series honors his vision of collaborative partnerships and service. His family, colleagues, and friends established the endowed professorship and lecture series to honor his example and his vision. You can learn more about Professor Thurs at the website in the chat that we will add later. I also want to acknowledge the generations before us who brought us here to the present. In the US, that means we must acknowledge those who were brought here against their will through slavery, those who migrated from their homes from a, for a better life, and those who have lived here for generations and saw their lands taken away from them. We operate on the ancestral lands of Iroquian speaking Susquehannock peoples and Algonquin speaking peoples of the Cedarville Band of the Piscataway Conoy, the Piscataway Indian Nation, and the Piscataway Cano tribe, all of whom share this area in Maryland through their relations and whose descendants are thriving and resisting settler occupation. We also acknowledge the historical, deliberate, and ongoing attempts by settlers and their systems of oppression that perpetrate racist and violent acts of political, social, economic, and ecological white supremacy. We further acknowledge the fundamental role that these colonialist acts play in the historical and contemporary disenfranchisement, surveillance, and harm of Black Americans. May this digital space tonight and this lecture serve as one moment among many for ending anti-Black racism, modern colonialism, and white supremacy and for creating equitable relations that honor and heal communities of the land. Tonight's event is hosted by our own Professor Corey Shadema as our Thurs Professor. As befitting her professional background, Corey Shadema is a scholar who focuses on how people work in and around policies that are unjust and ineffective in different substantive areas, such as child welfare, prostitution, and child care policies. She is dedicated to ensuring that the legal institutions, policies, and programs designed to assist those most affected work well on the front lines and that their voices are heard. Her dual background in law and social work 
has facilitated this research, both in her understanding of court proceedings and laws and in gaining access to a wide variety of legal venues. Dr. Shadema brings to her teaching both her social work scholarly training and her legal background, a powerful interdisciplinary perspective for social work educators. Her experience abroad in Israel, her deep affection for our students, and the school's commitment to social justice for all are the reasons she holds the position of the Thurs Distinguished Professor of Social Justice. Please welcome Professor Shadema. Thank you very much, um, Dean Postmas, for your kind welcome um, and for setting, up, uh, setting us off on, on the right foot this evening. Um, and welcome to all of those of you who have joined us today. The Daniel Thurs Social Justice Lecture is designed to create opportunities for dialogue within the University of Maryland School of Social Work and between our school and the community and networks in which we are embedded. As the name suggests, this lecture is founded on and driven by a commitment to social justice. In service of this commitment, we ask, what is it that we as social work educators and students should know and do? And how can our staff, faculty, students, and alumni collaborate with community partners about pressing, pressing issues of our time? We have seen a rise in gun violence in Baltimore and elsewhere across the country. This is a tragedy for everyone involved and for the communities that are disproportionately experiencing and grappling with violence. As an academic institution, we are often looked to as experts. We get grants, we run trainings, we write articles, and we weigh in on policy debates. However, as a social work institution, we also deeply believe that people are experts on their own lives and can often better speak to what resources exist or may be needed in their own communities. This is also compatible with core social work values of dignity, self-determination and strengths-based approaches. We are here today to listen and to learn from our Baltimore community. And we are grateful to today's speakers for their willingness to share with us from their experiences and their work to prevent, address, and heal community violence. Uh, before I introduce our facilitators, I wanna first um, thank uh, the many people who help us behind the scenes to bring this biannual Thurs lecture. Um, I wanna publicly acknowledge and express my gratitude to Shante Hatch Hatcher, Naisha Jones, Anita Bryant, and Isabel Garcia. I am now honored to introduce our two facilitators who will in turn start our panel off. Caroline Harmondaro, PhD, MSW, LSW, is a senior community program specialist in the Prevention of Adolescent Risks Initiative at the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Social Work, where she collaborates on several projects related to the Maryland Human Trafficking Initiative. Her research and scholarship center on reducing violence, victimization, and incarceration, including through a graduate research assistantship with the National Institutes of Justice. And she serves as the co-chair of the Grand Challenges of Social Work Smart Decarceration Committee Policing Workgroup. Uh, Dr. Harmon Darrow has also been a, was a community me mediator for 24 years. Uh, she trains, mentors, and evaluates other mediators, and she's held leadership positions in the local, state, and national conflict resolution organization. And I am very happy for her, but sad to say that she will be leave, leaving us for an assistant professor position at Rutgers University um, soon. Our second moderator facilitator is Dr. Kyla Liggett Creel, who likes to be known as Dr. K. And Dr. K is a clinical associate professor at the School of Social Work, University of Maryland School of Social Work. Dr. Liga Creel is, is the director of the collaborative, a healing centered community. She is chair of the mayor's youth trauma work group, facilitator for the mayor's cabinet for boys and young men of color, and a staff person for the Baltimore City Trauma Task Force Youth Work Group. Dr. Liggett Creel is also the founder and director of the Healing Youth Alliance, and she's working on several initiatives partnering with community-based minority-run nonprofits to prevent and heal from community violence. Dr. K's area of specialization is youth leadership, 
healing-centered engagement, trauma, and equity. So thank you very much to Drs. Lee Creel and, uh, and Harmon Darrow, and um, please uh, take it from here. Thank you so much, Dr. Shadema. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. We will have our wonderful partners and panelists to come on screen uh, so that we can do some introductions. It is my absolute great honor to welcome um, all of our partners here this evening. And I will ask for each person to introduce themselves and also share a little bit about your mission and goals for your organization. Reverend Barnes, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Corey Barnes. I serve as the president of We, Our, Us Unity Men's Movement, along with the pastor of Grace City Church in Baltimore. Um, we, we, Our, Us is an organization that does four things. We protect, connect, mediate, and message in the community. Um, we are a group of men uh, before the pandemic, uh, over a thousand men going out into the community uh, three times a week, uh, engaging in uh, mediation, as well as food distribution, as well as helping those with substance abuse to get into rehab. Um, so, and we have a Stop the Beef hotline where no police involved, where we mediate and even if, even have taken people outside of the state to uh, get, keep them protected. So that's what we do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Reverend Barnes. A wonderful yeah. movement, been out there multiple times and it's amazing. I hope lots and lots of guys can join you. Uh, Ms. Jones, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about your organization you work with? Sure, thank you, Pavela. Dr. K. Um, I am Jakia Jones. I am one of six co-organizers with Baltimore Ceasefire 365. Uh, what Baltimore Ceasefire 365 does is we have a goal of seeing zero murders in Baltimore City. And how we plan on seeing that is, are through different, different events, different things. One, our sacred space rituals. That's somewhere where we um, actually honor those that have um, been murdered. And we do that because a lot of times we see that those spaces are filled with negative energy. We want to make sure that we can fill that area with joy and happiness. We know something hurtful happened there, but we want to change that um, and not let murder have the last say so there. So that's one of the things we have. Um, the big thing is our ceasefire weekends. We have four of those throughout the year. Um, the last one was just this past weekend. So we have it Mother's Day weekend um, to honor the fathers and mothers that have lost um, children due to violence. We, the next one is in August. That is our inaugural um, annual um, ceasefire weekend. And um, that is held the first week weekend in August. Then the next one after that will be the November ceasefire weekend, also the first weekend in November. And then there will be the February ceasefire first weekend in February. Um, the other thing is that we ask everyone in Baltimore City to take the peace challenge. That's the other portion of the Baltimore ceasefire. And, and by doing that, we know that everyone can stand to be a little more peaceful. And so if you take the peace challenge, then you're taking the challenge to watch your word, watch your words, your thinking, um, and, as well as your behaviors. Because sometimes we forget that our words have power and you may not be out committing violence or violent acts, but you may be speaking ill will on people. You may be thinking negative thoughts. So it's important to think of those also. That's what we are. That's who we are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Jones. And you can always tell when it's ceasefire weekend because the vibrations are high and the energy is flowing and the peace is wonderful. So thank you so much. Mr. Sparks, uh, can you tell us about uh, Sons of Phoenix? Sure will. First of all, uh, good evening, everyone. My name, uh, my name is Kelly Sparks. I am the founder and director of the Sons of Phoenix. We engage community members where they're adding their life by providing services such as case management, refer them to mental health services, uh, drug treatment programs, employment, vocational training. Also, we were connecting them as far as getting back in school, also uh, college. We also work with young uh, youth and adults doing gang prevention or gang violence or conflict resolution and try to mediate 
when there is a conflict between people in the community so that it don't or won't lead to violence. Thank you. Thanks to each of you so much. Um, the next question we wanna ask is for each of you again to talk about what personally brought you to this work. What is your own story of coming to do this mission in the community? And again, we'll go in the same order. Okay. Well, uh, for me, this work started, uh, well, it actually started in uh, probably 1995 uh, down in the Sandtown Winchester community uh, where uh, we uh, was a part of a work uh, of a, uh, called New Song Urban Ministries where we built 276 houses. We had a health center as well as a school uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, that was my, my, my training ground uh, with my mentor, Susan and Alan Tibbles, uh, who taught me a lot about uh, community work. Um, and that's a story all within itself. Um, and then that kind of started me back in 95. And then uh, I went, I was there from 95 to 2005. And then 10 years later, we had a ride in Baltimore 2015. Uh, and from that moment was a monumental moment uh, for our city. It was a monumental moment. Uh, a lot of people didn't notice, but uh, Freddie Gray, his best friend Juan, and his uh, other best friend William Stewart. William Stewart, I taught him at New Song, and they came to me to assist them on how to have their voices heard. And so I was the connector between. Uh, getting the voices heard with the police and all of that. Um, but uh, our city had, it had gotten beyond the, the players of Baltimore and it became a more of a national thing and it got out of their control. And then um, from that moment, I began to connect with uh, people all over the city. And one of the people I connected with at the police station uh, was uh, Andrew Muhammad. Um, who in the very beginning um, uh, was right there with the Nation of Islam. And I was there with 200 pastors and we met each other from that very moment, making sure young people didn't cross the line because we had already had a conversation with Melvin Russell that if anyone crossed, they would have to get locked up. If you keep them from going across, everything's fine. So we kind of had a negotiation in that moment. And so our, our job was to keep the young people from going across the lines at that moment. Anyway. That started from 2015, and from 2015, uh, we know the mayor, Catherine Pugh, did something that was very bold, which was to have an office in the mayor's office on African-American male engagement. And from that moment, um, to concentrate simply on African-American males, well, we know the story with Catherine Pugh, and from that moment, the question became, how do we make this, give this back to the community? And that's when I came in, where one who has been doing nonprofits for over 15 years, it was important that we make this a nonprofit, give this back to the community and the community. And from that point on, that's how I got involved in this work. And we've been engaging the unfortunate process 2015. We've had over 300 murders ever since. And so we've been engaging. We felt that and with the consent decree, uh, the police couldn't engage. So the question becomes, who's going to be the engagers? And we said, as men, we're going to be the engagers going to get our young men and engage in them. So that's how we, that, that was the thing that sparked us to jump out in the community. Thanks, Ms. Jones. For myself, um, I have been personally affected by violence since, well, murder, since um, high school. My first experience with it was when my cousin was murdered and when I was in high school. So from that point, um, my family has experienced a lot of murder. There's a lot of my little cousins growing up without their fathers. And um, it has definitely impacted me to the point that I knew that I couldn't just let that happen and not do anything. So um, my first thoughts were that, that I would go into criminal justice and um, somehow change the violence there. And it didn't pan out. I ended up in social work. I'm a recent grad of the School of Social Work at University of Maryland, 2021. Um, so 
here I am just because it's been impacting myself as well as my children, um, my close friends. And I, I just couldn't sit by and not do anything. I wanted to be a change maker. And Mr. Sparks? Yes, uh, once again, yeah, uh, good evening. Um, what brought me to this work? I believe that um, in 1992, I was uh, selling drugs. I, I think I ran like four districts. Um, then to make a long story short, um, a stick of void came up on me and I took his gun and I shot him, which changed my life. I wound up in 954 Far Street. They put me, um, even though I acted like I was grown, they put, they put, they put a young man in uh, the penitentiary around wolves. And I had to survive. I had to have a survival's mentality. I realized um, in, in the beginning part of my incarceration that I had to change. Because the person I wanted to kill him was, even though he was a stick up boy, I grew up with him. And at one time we used to mess with sisters. So that touched me even more. I knew his children. So um, reached out to the family. Before that was a such thing as, you know, uh, you know, talking media between the families, you know, for a perpetrator that actually shot someone, regardless if it was in the right or the wrong. And from then on, I wound up uh, changing my life, which, uh, led me to uh, start my own self-help groups, help one to, one to make a change, not just in prison, but outside and reaching my hand beyond the walls because I seen what was going on in my community and I realized I played a part in that community. And I know the only way that was going to stop that, us that once used to be part of the problem would now have to be part of the solution. So I knew that one day I was going to be free and I was going to come out here and start doing the work. And I done I had 50 years, I, I wound up doing 27 years and eight months, came home, hit the ground, never looked back, uh, stuck, you know, wound up um, doing a lot of work in the community. A lot of people thought that I was actually uh, working for youth organizations and things, but I was just out there on my own accord, you know, because I had a passion. And I uh, wound up meeting Dr. K and I started the Sons of Phoenix, you know, and that's how, that's, that's how you know, it all came together. Thank you. Thank oh, you so much. Oh, and I apologize. Uh, Sons of Phoenix stands for uh, Saving Others Never Stops. Saving Others Never Stops. It used to be just for young men, but then I realized it didn't have an agenda because whenever you got a word, you already know about an acronym with the prayers, Saving Others Never Stop is not an agenda regardless of creed, uh, uh, creed, class, or color. So Saving Others Never Stop. Stopping the violence never stops. Our job never stops. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all so much for sharing uh, information with us about your history, um, the work that you all have done and what brought you here today. Um, the next set of questions is really open for all three of you and there's no specific order. So you can just jump in whenever. Uh, so the first question is, what do you believe the role of social workers is in and alongside community movements? I'll go. So I think social workers are a very important part um, of community movements. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Um, policy, um, social workers are good in the macro uh, side with being in the thick of everything. Um, and I'll give an example. Uh, I work for an eviction prevention program. And all of this is systemic and goes together with violence. So if we can change certain things, it then it, it eliminates violence and reduces violence. So um, basically having people who are knowledgeable on the ground, knowing what's going on in the communities um, is important to, for policy change purposes. Um, they know what, what uh, challenges they are having. They know um, what's been working, what's not working. Um, also, um, while in the street, they have a special skill set to be able to uh, not only communicate with, with, um, with people in the neighborhoods, but also they allow them to feel heard. Um, that's been also in my experience with Ceasefire is going out, a lot of the corner boys, that, that's my focus. Um, justice involved youth is really my, um, my focus. So. Having just talking to the corner boys, that's the first thing. They just want to be heard. 
I go out and I ask them, what do you need to be a better version of yourself? And just listening to them, they tell us what they want. So I, I believe the skills that a social worker has are important for outreach. They're important for um, evaluating um, programs, um, policy change, um, things of that nature. I'll just go ahead and add on to uh, Jakia's uh, statement, which is, I think uh, as one who engages in the community about 22 times a month, along with um, over the past three years, um, the role of the social worker is very important because uh, if you think about Maslow hierarchy of need, uh, when we're approaching individuals, uh, the, physio the physiological and the safety are the two major things. Uh, the social work is the resource engine to connect those things. So as we are engaging, and as Jakia said, getting the information, uh, what is the necessary thing? One of the things that we don't engage with our resources, that's what makes we are us a little different. Uh, we don't go without anything in our hands. So what the social work does is equipped us with more things in our hand so that we could connect that problem to a solution and then we can begin to transition individuals off the corner. So social workers are resource engine, but here is the catch. Uh, it is important uh, that we not wait on them, the individual to come to you, but you stand beside and go to the community and, and began to walk with them and bring the resources to them. And that the day of waiting on people to come to you has shifted in this season. And so we just gotta be aware of that. And we need to partner with community uh, people who are engaging so that you can come with the resource in your hand. So I, that would what I would say, yep. Um, once again, um, Kelly Swash from Sunday Phoenix. Um, I think that, um, first of all, we got to understand um, the, the very importance of uh, social work in, you know, in its totality when it comes to uh, re-engagement re and um, dealing with our community. I think they are the backbone. Now, what I mean by this is that Dr. K, right? Since I've known her, she's been advocating and, not, and a lot of people that think like Dr. K, right? Instead of being in the office, not saying that being in the office is bad, right? But when you're doing a lot of outreach and you're doing a lot of engagement, I think that the partnership going out in the community, not all the time, but enough times where as though you can make that, that connection. Uh, the social workers, is things that I can't do, you know, that the social worker can't do in the community, but we come together and we can do together. Like, far as like the social worker can remove barriers that I can't remove because I don't have the certifications, you know, uh, access the resources, you know, connect us to the resources or connect the community to those resources. Um, so I think that, that um, the social work department is very key, you know, in us going forward, you know, especially in this day and time, especially every time you cut on the news and you see the violence. The next question we have is um, the role of the faith community, both in your particular organization and more broadly in the struggle to end community violence. I guess I'll start that, huh? <laughs> um, so uh, the role of the faith community is critical. Um, because uh, social workers, you have a LC, LCSWC, uh, uh, but we as community engagers has a QVC, um, which is quality uh, connective, QCR, quality connected relationship. All right, we have a certification and quality connected relationship. If you're gonna stop killing in Baltimore, it's got to happen through quality connected relationship. And let me tell you why. So many of the cases in Baltimore has to do with crime of passion more so than some vague situation, which means, what am I saying? I'm saying 
Dr. K and I are friends and something happens between Dr. K and I and then then an incident rises to a place that I shoot Dr. K. Many of the cases in Baltimore, we have passion crime, which means you got to be in that relationship and at home to even, it's almost like domestic violence. Police don't want a, a call for domestic violence because it, it's, they know each other, it's relational. So Q, quality connected relationship becomes very important. Well, that's the job of the faith community, which is to bring relationship, to bring a quality relationship so that one can uh, connect social workers and police to the community. And then there's, there's another side that I think is magical about the We Are Us movement and Kelly Sparks mentioned it, but I'm gonna put some terminology to it if you will allow me to live in my world, which is theology. Uh, there is this word called missio theosis. And what that means is that their missio is mission. Theosis means participation with God. So I'm not here to preach, but let me just say this because this is important. There are a lot of men that have had a relationship with God and feel that it's their mission to go out in the community and give the love that was given to them to change someone else's life. Messiotheosis, it's a participation, an experience that they have that then go out in the community and then help someone else. A lot of the men at We Are Us are experiencing this, are going out out of that. It's that's not going out because just violence. It is a call, it's a mission for a different, it, it's interfaith for, you know, other religions it could be seeking enlightenment, whatever, but it is a missional thing uh, that people, and, and Kelly Sparks spoke to it, you know, it's it's this thing that that's inside of them that makes them want to, so faith has a very important role on why the men are out there. We don't talk about that. We don't, you know, a lot of men are, uh, that are with me are saying, I'm out here because I've messed up the community. And now that I have a relationship of love, I got to give that love back to change my community. Messiotheosis, a participation. So that, that's a, I just, I ain't mean to get deep, but just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Yeah. I'll go. Um, so within Baltimore Ceasefire 365, um, it's a self-determination. So the church definitely, faith-based organizations definitely have a place um, within our movement. Um, I will say what I, we, we need more of it. It's definitely important. We need more um, participation. We don't see a lot. Um, we get um, events and things planned by faith-based organizations, but we would like to see more. Um, I have one story that I will share that why, why it's important. We had a murder, um, it was a ceasefire weekend. And during ceasefire weekends, if someone is murdered, we provide the family with monetary donation so that they can do whatever they want with. Um, while at this sacred space ritual, uh, there's a church at that block. And I don't know if they weren't comfortable with coming over um, while we were there. The mother of the, the um, murdered person was there. And it just would have been amazing for that connection to happen. To me, I feel like, um, faith-based organizations, uh, if everybody stayed in there, the, the idea of ceasefire is that every body does something in their area. Who better to do something in that area than the people there? You know it better than me going in there and telling you, hey, we should do this. You know what's going to work. You know what resources are needed. You know everything that that, that community, that neighborhood needs. So I would have loved for that church to just hey, we're here. This, these are the hours that we're here. Same way you guys were talking about going out with the resources. Resources right there. Faith-based organizations are a resource. And I would just love for them to come out and, you know, participate, um, say a prayer, do whatever it is in that space with the family. So I feel like there's definitely, definitely important part of the, the um, preventing the violence um, 
And that's just one example, just coming out and being one with the community is one example of what I think would be beneficial from the faith-based organizations. Um, <clears throat> the faith-based uh, community, um, I'm just looking at it from a different point of view, right? Um, I'm looking at the new model is that regardless of what your faith is, you got to come out the doors. You got to come out the doors because the stuff is happening outside the doors. It's not happening in the doors. And um, the Sons of Phoenix also understand that we look at we are us, right? One thing I love about the model about we are us is that you got many different uh, 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 faith. You got uh, more signs. You got Nation of Islam. You got Sunni. You got this, this, this Christian, uh, dad Christian. I mean, it's just many facets of religion coming together. Not really putting a religion to the side, but putting what they uh, disagree on and going into the community about what they agree on, which is love and saving the community. See, when they start seeing more of love, love trumps and overpowers all. See, the violence in the community is because there's a lack of love and a lack of misunderstanding and misguided uh, emotions. Misguided emotions, you know, because uh, one thing I learned when I first came home is that it, 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 it baffled me or it shocked me that uh, the young men are more emotional than 13-year-old young women. You say, how you doing? Bow, 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 bow. What, what just happened? Because it's a, it's a disconnect. So I think the faith-based community, right, plays a key role. You know, regardless of what you believe in, right, the faith, the faith of that source or that higher power need to be out there in that community because it's bigger than all of us. It's not about I or me. It's about we and us. We all we got. We all we need. I was about to respond, Mr. Sparks. I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> Come on. Uh, thank you all so much for those wonderful responses and just the wealth of information and expertise you all offer. Just always an honor to be in your presence. The next thing we wanted to talk about was, can you speak to what is particularly important about the role of grassroots organizations to end violence and why may they be effective? So specifically the grassroots perspective, why is that so effective in ending violence? Okay. You want me to go? Okay. I mean, I think it goes back to, uh, back to the quality connected relationships. Um, grassroots organizations have a more intimate uh, understanding of the dynamics of each community. And we, you know, social workers know this, right? Uh, the different dynamics of each community. Uh, you know, you could go on one side of Hanover Street and the other side of Hanover Street is a whole different world. Uh, Autobahn versus, um, versus Leaden Hall, you know, right? So they are two different worlds, same looking house. Uh, but two different worlds, right? So uh, it is so important uh, that the grassroots organization would understand that you can't be on the outside and cross Hanover Street and not understand that this is two different cultural worlds unless you are grassroots and embedded into that, into that organization and that relationship. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I, I continue uh, to push this idea of quality connected relationships along with understanding that, um, again, you know, even in Baltimore, we understand that the crime that we hear, a lot of it is crime and passion, which means relationship plays a very important part in the prevention of the crime. Again, I ask you to put the hat on as domestic violence. It's a reason why the police roll their eyes when they see domestic violence. It is because once you get in that, it could turn on you. Um, so that's why they, so when we look at the crime of pet, these are so many, and I don't have the percentage numbers and I, I will not stand in front of scholarly social work and throw out a number. So I will say there are a lot of, there's a high, there's over 50% of the cases that we're seeing gunshots. And let me prove it to you have to do with crime of passion. Let me tell you how we know. Look at the number of headshot wounds. It is because how you get that close? We know they got close because they knew the person. 
And so, so much of what is, so that takes grassroot connection in order to prevent that, to be honest with you. You gotta know both parties <laughs> in order to stop that. And so that's where grassroots in the, in the culture of violence becomes so important. Who would like to go next? Ms. Jones, Mr. Sparks. I wasn't trying to go before her, you know, women before men. So, uh, <laughs> you know, respect. Um, grassroots uh, are most definitely uh, key because uh, order for the work, you got to have somebody that know the community, the ins and outs of the community. Not saying that nobody from the outside can't come in, but they got to come in with a grassroots organization. That's why they call grassroots because they got their roots embedded in that community whether they was part of the problem or part of the solution. Because everybody that used to be part of the problem, they ain't always uh, uh, wasn't part of the solution. So how do you cut it? So um, I think they go hand in hand. But one thing that I want to uh, point out, right, with grass grassroots organizations, right, a lot of them do the gritty work that never gets mentioned. And we don't want it to get mentioned. You know, stuff that calls at three or four in the morning, you know, uh, 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 mediating, somebody cussing you out, somebody disappointing you and you still there to help them out, you know, uh, helping a child get from A to B, regardless of what that might look like. You know, even when you tired, we still doing the job because struggle in this is most definitely ordained. So uh, the grassroots organization most definitely play key because they see things from a different perspective because they are right there and they got their roots right there. So other organizations can partner on, you know, and help, but they need the grassroots organizations because you can't say that you're from uh, uh, Beverly Hills and understand what's going on on Pennsylvania and Gold or North Avenue and uh, uh, Pennsylvania because that, I mean, come on, be real. And you go, if, you, if you come to stand there, talk about you need help, you're going to stand out and everybody going to be looking at you like you don't even belong. So you need somebody from the grassroots organization to show you around. And you know, get you in, in, entwined or uh, get you uh, connected to what's going on, so y'all could do the job. So, also that we could do the job. It's the, don't forget, it's not about our me, it's about we and us. So, uh, that's where we at. Thank you. And sister, don't let me go before you no more. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I will echo what Mr. Sparks said as well as Reverend Barnes. Um, Rapport and trust. Uh, a lot of times the grassroots organizations have done that gritty, dirty work. Um, we are told things that the police aren't told. You know, we see things, we, we hear things, we're trusted, we're respected. Um, a lot of times they're in their lane, like everybody just said. Um, they know the communities, they know the neighborhoods, they know what, what works, as I kind of mentioned earlier. And while we can have other programs come in and help out and maybe sponsor something or they have um, initiatives and ideas, they, they're great, but they definitely need to talk to the grassroots organizations, as Mr. Spark said, so that they can find out um, how to help. How do I fit in? Where's my place in this? Um, it, just give that, provide that respect. Um, and then I believe it could be more helpful for the outside organizations to come in and help. Thank you so much. So the next question I have comes from some of my experiences as a community organizer and um, really wanting to understand um, the details of how you bring community members into your organization. How do they become um, involved with you and how do they stay involved and how do you do kind of recruitment onboarding training like all of that all of those pieces um, what's the nitty-gritty of getting involved with your organizations uh, Kelly said you got to go first you kid so sorry <laughs> all right <laughs> okay so Baltimore Seeds Fire we are actually we have open Anybody can be a part of Baltimore Seeds Fire. Our audience is 
everybody who loves Baltimore, whether you live here, don't live here. If you love Baltimore and you want to see Baltimore th thrive, hop on, <laughs> like join us. Self-determination, whatever that means to you, whatever you want to do, you're allowed to do it. Just if you need some support, we'll find you some support, but it's whatever you want to do. Um, how, if you want to be more intimately involved, then you can become a, a ceasefire ambassador. Um, applications are open now. You can go to baltimoreceasefire.com to fill out an application. Um, it's not your normal application because again, it's a self-determination. So it's not like you're a job interview or something like that. Uh, we just want to make sure that you're loving on Baltimore and you're going to do the right things out in the street. Um, so how, how we engage, was that also the question? Okay. Um, outreach and um, like I said, we, we don't target a, a specific group or anything. We go in like anybody, everybody can reach somebody. So that's the idea with Baltimore Ceasefire. Um, I may, I'm good with the youth. Uh, so like I just go out, I'm, I'm able to have conversations where other people are like, oh no, that's not, that's not my lane. So you choose your lane and you, you ride it like, and, and just collaborate with who works with you, what works with you. That's why I love Baltimore Ceasefire because it's all about your, com your comfortability. Wherever you feel like you fit, you go. If you feel uncomfortable, you come talk to somebody and we figure out how that works. Um, but you stay where you're, you're most, where you feel you're needed and you feel you're most useful. Um, you do it that way. And it all inclusive. Um, ambassadors start at the age of 12 and youth are very important. We have a, half of our ambassadors, about 20, we're like, we're more than 50 now ambassadors, um, but we have a good amount of youth, but we're always looking for more because we need their voices to be heard. Um, so I would say we're targeting youth, youth um, ambassadors. So if you know any uh, youth, 12 and up, send them our way. They wanna be out here in the streets trying to make uh, Baltimore a little more peaceful. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> we're we're basically open, just like ceasefire, um, but we're we're a little different, um, and we are African American male led, um, and its approach um, very intentional uh, because the elephant in the room is that. The killings in Baltimore is African-American males killing African-American males. Um, the majority of them is, and then we have females as well. Um, so that's that's very intentional um, that that black men are going to get our black boys. Um, that we do, we are not, we are very specific about that. Um, one of the things that we know that the father has been absent from the home for a long time. And a lot of these young men didn't have men in their lives. And we needed to come to the community as a group of black men saying, first of all, we love you. Um, and we're coming to get you. We're coming to get you with resources, love, compassion, and, and to walk with you through life. Um, so it, that's that's very intentional. Now it's open for anyone and everyone. Uh, Dr. Kay hangs out with us uh, as, as much as she likes, um, but it's open to, to anyone and everyone. Um, one of the things is that we're, we're unapologetically uh, clear that we are in the most dangerous and violent areas in Baltimore City. Um, intentionally. Um, and with that said, we use wisdom um, on who comes with us at night. Um, so uh, we try to keep uh, women safe. Uh, so we, we uh, try to uh, keep the women away at night, but uh, because we need to have, uh, we have systems in place that, uh, that is wisdom uh, when you're traveling in uh, areas of violence. And so uh, it's no discrimination or anything like that. We just, the heart behind it is keeping uh, everyone safe. Again, it's the messio theosis, which is people feel I must go and do this. And I'm literally, I'm saying I'm willing to give my life up for this. Um, and we're not asking that from everyone else. We're not asking that from our women, but the men that are out there are willing to give their life for another child for to save a child. Um, that's behind it. <laughs> uh, so that, that's why that, that, that's so critical. So you can join We Are Us at any time. Just come to a walk. You're a part of We Are Us. You graduate, you get a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, and uh, you, you in. So 
Um, the Sons of Phoenix, we are open as well, right? Uh, we're looking for uh, youth that, uh, that that's trying to uh, deal with their service hours. Uh, we want uh, in, uh, interns in college, uh, volunteers, you know, whatever you think you can help bring to the organization to make the organization better and stronger. You got to have a, a will that failure is not an option. Because we can't go into what we do defeated with a mindset that we already defeated. We got to come with energy, a different type of energy, an overwhelming energy that's backed by love. That's force and power. And once people see uh, us in the communities and we and we out, out there doing outreach and engagement, right, they're going to want to hook on anyway because we contagious. You know, we, 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 we got that disease that we ain't trying to go to the hospital for nobody to get rid of because we're going to be out there saving others, never stops. So if you're trying to get your service hours, you're trying to do intern and you're trying to volunteer, whatever that looks like, you know, you know, just follow us uh, or uh, sign up at uh, sonsofphoenix.org. We got, a, we got a, uh, a spot on there where you could do for volunteers and everything and you shoot us an email and, uh, you know, we'll connect you. It's not that hard. It's just simple. You know, save, save, saving, um, saving others never stop. It's not that hard. It's just simple. We just make it hard. We just make it hard. We all come together. We're going to make it easy. You know, lead the politics out of it. Save our people. Thank you all so much. Um, so the next question that we want to talk about is, is about resources. What resources do you think community-led efforts could benefit from? If you're thinking about resources that would be helpful, what, what, what are those resources? You have to go first, Jakia. <laughs> okay, I love resources. First, I wanna say, please, um, I feel like there should be resources that are actually functional. Um, we have resources in place and our biggest failure right now is that we are linking people and the organization or the place that we're um, linking them to is out of funding, um, isn't um, in operation anymore. That builds distrust, that builds frustration. So that's number one, make sure that the resource is functional and operational. Um, resources that are needed. Uh, when we're out doing outreach, that, those are one of the things we ask about. Our felons really, they don't want to be in the streets. They don't want to be out there. Um, they don't want to kill people, like despite what some may think. Um, they're asking for programs that once they complete them, they actually can get a job. Their problem right now when I do outreach is that several of them have been told, hey, if you just, we have a job, um, a program for felons. Once you complete it, you'll be good. Once they've completed these programs, they were unable to get a job because that felony was still there. So um, again, distrust, what happens, they go back out in the street. They're telling me, you know, look, we have families to feed. We have um, needs. So we, we have to survive. So that's number one that, that I hear. Um, they are not, they need job training, but a, another story, um, there was a group of people in Park Heights that got job training and uh, a job came out and said, we'll hire all of you guys with the felonies, we are all good. They want the job, so they went, they weren't able to pass, pass the math test. Um, it was embarrassing. They did not wanna come back. They offered tutors, they told them they could come back and you know we'll still help you. They did not want to come back. They're men. They, you know, that that was degrading. That was embarrassing. And I'll just stop there. We won't, we won't go, you know, I don't want to go um, take any more training. We're good. We're going to go back to what we know. I'm comfortable here. I can make money. It's, it's a given. So I don't know how to fix that. I don't, I'm just going to throw that out there. And our um, people that are watching can kind of figure out there some, needs to be something where they feel safe and comfortable to receive training. Um, they feel uh, welcome, um, non-judgmental environment, and something that actually has some success at the end, and not just a, I have another program under my belt, 
but I'm actually able to start working after I complete this program or during the program. Um, so felony uh, resources is, is huge uh, in, in what I've been seeing. And outside of that, housing issues. There's so many housing issues. Um, and I don't know that we have funding. I don't know, but I'm just gonna throw that out there. We need housing resources. Um, people are having difficulty, especially coming out of the pandemic, paying rent. Rent is huge. Um, and finding housing is another thing. So housing, job readiness um, in, in a safe environment and help for, our justice involved youth um, as well as adults. I'll begin with something that's not as tangible, um, which is the number one resource that's needed right now is trust. And Jakia, actually, you actually nailed it. It is trust. And let me just say this trust is not because of your degree. It's not because of your last name. It has nothing to do with what you bring. Trust, you have to create a collision. And this collision is integrity and competency. When those two things crash, trust begins to happen. I, I, and I know you are social work, so I don't want to insult you. So here it is. When competency, when competency crashes with uh, integrity, oxytocin kicks in for a baby. When a baby recognizes that, they start going towards you and want to hang around you all day long. So what do you think when you go to the corner, if you could bring competency and, you're in, and what you say you can do and it crashes, what do you think the people at the corner are going to do? They're going to be you know, and I'm gonna be honest, I don't mean to embarrass her, but that's one of the reasons why people are so attracted to Dr. K is because she creates this collision that continues that, that when that crash happens, I'm gonna keep calling her because I because integrity and competency when it crash, oxytocin kicks in, and then you move towards that thing that it does. Um, so I don't I know y'all social workers, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring the elementary stuff, but I I, I it's so important that we understand that that's your number one resource. And again, I'll go back to Jakea. I can't repeat it any clear. We need more housing. We need more beds for rehab. Um, and we need to, and, and, and we've done a really good job. And I'll just challenge that. We're doing a really good job with job placement. The problem is uh, keeping people in those jobs and walking with them um, through, Because we have a theory which is not true, which is if I get you a job, my life or things are going to be better, right? That's this idea. But then what happens is we come crashing with this idea of purpose and the meaning of this job and the meaning for my life. And what happens is once they get the check and the check doesn't bring a sense of purpose and meaning, and now we're dealing with that now. Um, you are a social worker school. I know because of all of the money you make, I, I know that's why you're there, right? Um, so I'm just, <laughs> but no, it's that thing called purpose and meaning and all of that. So now we're getting people the money to deal with the things, but then the whole idea of purpose and meaning begins to kick in. And that's what keeps the social work in place. That's what keeps uh, men going out in the co community. So that becomes uh, important to that on the back end of getting a job, walking people through to who they're created to be um, and moving them in that while they had that resource is important. So I'll just stop there. That was wonderful. Oh man. Um, when I go out in the corners, when I do uh, outreach and engagement, right? We say trust, right? But they also use another language, right? Your word got to be born. They equate that with trust. Your word. They might not like what you're saying, but your word got to mean everything. That's what makes a strong grassroots organization. Their word. Results. Common sense. Resources. You know, uh, I don't want to just say it, but leave the politics out of it. 
that's what's hindering a lot of this uh good stuff from happening out in our communities is politics. You know, if we know that somebody rent need to be uh, done, we shouldn't have to uh, send the application nine different places in order for the rent to get done. If we know we need to get a child in school, it shouldn't have to take four to five meet meetings or to get the child back in school. That's a problem. See, that's where the social works, uh, 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 the social work and, and the grassroots organizations come on the outreach, come together. That's when they come together. That's, that's when they connect. And what I have learned, right, is that you can give anybody a job, but can they keep it? You know, I helped, I gonna say, I helped a young brother with a job and um, his boss called me and told me that, uh, you know, he gonna fire him. And then 15 minutes later, he called back and he fired him. So when I spoke to the little young man, he said, yeah, man, he gonna tell me what, I just came to work, he gonna try to tell me what I gotta do. <laughs> I said, I said, what do you actually do? He told me to go over there and clean up. I said, what's your job? Sanitation. He got to give me enough time to breathe when I come in, come to work. I said, oh, yeah, where they do that at, right? So it let me, it let me, it, it taught me a valuable lesson, right? Job training. We got to make sure they get job training, you know, before we send them out on these jobs. We might think they're capable of, and they might say they're capable of doing the job, but we got to know. We can't think. We got to know. But really common sense and your word. You got to make your word bond. Because once your word become born in the communities, right, you're going to see a lot more good results. People will start trusting you and people will start flocking towards you, regardless of what organization you're in. You don't have to say nothing about your organization. They're going to speak your organization because the results is going to be known in the community. But most definitely are resources. We can talk all we want, but we need resources. We need money. You know, we need money. You know, because we got to graduate them from the corner and to uh, 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 make themselves stable first. Meet them where they are, not where we want them to be. Meet them where they are so they could be a better individual, not just to themselves, but to their family, then their community, and then the nation as a whole. So we got to meet them where they are, not where we want them to be. But it takes resources to graduate them from the corner and to the workforce or workforce development. So our next question has to do with this institution that we're speaking within right now. Um, University of Maryland, Baltimore receives millions of dollars um, to study violence and to study the best possible ways of doing prevention, intervention and healing. Um, so kind of knowing that, how, does, how do you think UMB should best use its resources in service to the community? I'll go. <laughs> um, so I am macro. So program evaluation um, is so, so important, more so than I think we, we really know, but we really need to actually get down into the work and, and do it. Things like um, Mr. Sparks had mentioned, applications. These are the things we need to be evaluating. We have a lot of um, applications and processes for, for different things. And a lot of times our community members aren't able to do these things. So they're at a disadvantage because now I have, and, and especially with the pandemic, now we have electronic applications. So I'm not able to go print something or be given a piece of paper and, and give it back to you, which was already an issue before the pandemic. That, you know, that was hard to do as well. But now I have to use a phone in order to complete this application for services that I need. And my phone isn't, the document isn't, um, it's, isn't phone compatible, isn't compatible with your phone. Your tablet, if you're lucky enough to have a tablet, isn't compatible. Um, then you're sending someone who may have a disability, may have a physical ailment or, or anything like that to the library to go get this done. So these things are not helpful. Um, and I think that we really need to evaluate what are better ways to do this? What programs do work for phones? How can I get distribute phones? How can I distribute tablets? 
Whatever that looks like, I think that to me is really, really important right now to get some of these services. We have a lot of people that are just giving up. Like, hey, I can't be on my phone. An example, my personal experience. I can't be on the phone to get this help. I'm at work. I have to work and I'm unable to do this. So guess what? Thanks for trying, but I don't even want the help anymore. That's not like, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. So my macro brain is saying we need to really evaluate these things and not just say we're evaluating these things, um, not just do it for the numbers and say, oh, this is what we need and not do anything about it. We have to move forward and do something about it. Maybe some policy changes. I don't know, but make the next step. Don't just stop there. We've gathered this information. We know that this is working, not working or whatever else. We have to move forward with it. So this is what I would charge University of Maryland with is actually doing the, um, we don't always have to go out in the neighborhoods. There's a lane for everybody. So again, like just be out there collecting the, the information. If there's money to, out there, let's use it to figure out what's working, what's not, and actually put some things in place to actually make these things better. I think, um, and I've been thinking about this a lot, which is the University of Maryland is strategically placed to do something probably no other institution is able to do. And it is to reverse care. Reverse care, and what, what do I mean? University of Maryland is probably the very few institutions because of your reputation of shock trauma, it's to start at the shock trauma all the way back into the home. So, because one of the things that Dr. Scalaire is so frustrated about is the returning of gunshot wounds of the same people. So what would it look like if the School of Social Work and this school, the medical school, started at the table that the life was saved. Now we do know the saving of life gives you the most influence on a person's life. So we do know if you save their life, you get to speak into their lives uh, uh, in ways that you would never be able to. So if you took that victim and began to bring the school of social work in and began to walk backwards from the surgery table all the way into the home and then began to trend. The University of Maryland is probably the only institution that has uh, that's positioned that way because of its greatness uh, to do that. So my challenge would be connect those two things so that we don't have to have this reoccurrence or we can begin to see, get, get from the, the wounds of the surgery table of the body to the wounds of the home and have a full healing all the way into the home. So I, I would only post this to University of Maryland because it, it's uniquely positioned to do that. So. Um, I think the University of Maryland should partner with communities rather too. We need to see more partnerships uh, and backing of uh, uh, small grassroots organizations. Um, like what I'm doing with the, uh, the University of Maryland now down on U in the Utah uh, coalition. Down there, what we do in our outreach uh, and our uh, community engagement is that, like what I was up there saying, we doing case, we go out there with the case management, we referring people to what? Mental health services because we got a lot of people that suffer from that. When you go down there, that's evidently, you know, that, that, that's, that's a given. Um, drug treatment, which is a big thing. Um, not just employment, right? But vocational, um, um, uh, vocational, uh, meaning like uh, your CDLs, you know, plumbing, things of that nature, because everybody don't want a job. Some people want a career. Uh, reconnecting them to schools, because you'd be amazed how many people that's down there that's not in school. They need to be in school. They don't, they don't even miss it by this much. You might think that some of them just, just dropped out at a young age. No, some of them dropped out at a, at a late age 
where as though they can easily go back and uh, uh, reconnect. And that's what we do when we go down there. And also we do a lot of gang prevention. So I think that the University of Maryland is in a unique uh, position, right? To continue to back grassroots organizations rather or partner, not just uh, connect, but partner with grassroots organizations to the community, you know, and uh, we need to see more partnerships, not just with this, the Sons of Phoenix. We just, we just want them. You got, you got, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, good organizations out there that's doing a lot of good work. We're not selfish. We know that we can't do it all. We just play our part. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, and those were wonderful answers to talk about what University of Maryland can do. Uh, we know that the university has historically had times where they have caused harm, and we continue to have times that we are causing harm. So what harms do you all see that we may be doing now or perpetuating that have been done in the past and we're just continuing to do? Um, so I really don't know what harms University of Maryland has, honestly, I don't, I don't know for sure, but in generally speaking, what I will say is, um, to make sure that you're not approaching things, um, from a savior perspective, um, that's really important. Like we all do want to help, but we don't want to go in trying to be someone's savior. Um, so just I'd be my, being mindful of that. Um, I think I'm going to take a different approach, but um, what I do see that can be harmful is having the resources and nobody knowing about it. And I'm going to um, promote one of your programs, ROAR. Um, is a great program that helps um, victims of violence but not many people know about it. So maybe um, some more marketing should be done around that. And I'm not sure if the clinics are still going on, but the, um, the legal clinics that were going on and the community events, they need to be promoted more. Um, they're definitely, we are, are not, one of our ceasefire core organizers will always say we're not resource deficient. Um, we just don't, people just don't know about them a lot of times. So um, promoting the things that we do have is really, really important so they can get utilized. I'll just continue the conversation I'm having with the collaboration. Again, this is the world that I live in. I, so many times, so many gunshots, uh, wounds, I've been called to the University of Maryland um, to deal with. And uh, one of the tragedies uh, that, um, you'll get put out. I mean, that's, let's just be very real. Like I've seen too many people be put out of the hospital. And I think social work services gotta collaborate with the medical field to fill that gap. Um, the church is not, I, as a past, I've been called in to support and things like that. We don't have the capacity and the resources that the University of Maryland school of social work has to fill that gap. But there were too many people that been patched up and put on the street. Um, and it's just the truth. I, I'm not making this up. I was called when they were on the street. So, um, and, and I had to pull together the things that I had to help get them where they are. But I just think you're too big of a resource engine and too profound of a social work school uh, to miss that gap in collaboration between the two. Um, it is too many gunshot wound people going out on the street and having nowhere to go in a gown. Um, I've, I've, I can tell you at least eight situations like that that should not be the case. Um, so I, I will say uh, we got to do better. <laughs> I thank God for having shock trauma here in Baltimore and the lives that's been saved from it, but we 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 can't send them out on a gown um, and without the social services uh, things in place. Yep. So I, I, that's all I have. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know too much harm 
that uh, the University of Maryland, um, you know, has done. But what I what what I will say, what I can say, is about the uh, funding and the resources. You know, uh, really put it behind uh, organizations that need it. You know, you know, I'm not gonna say that organizations that already uh, have the money, but those that's out there that uh, if you're getting three and four and five million dollars, don't keep giving to the same people. And then when you give it to them, don't 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 penny pitch them. I'm just calling. I'm just saying it with it like it is. Don't penny pitch them. You know, don't give them a uh, hundred thousand when you can give them four million for three years. So they program to get even stronger, so they can help people not come through the emergency door of your hospital or be in shock trauma. Because programs like the grassroots organization, just uh, community based programs. Are uh, uh, geared towards keeping people out the hospitals. Not saying that we can prevent, but we talk about violence, gang prevention, conflict resolution. You know, early teenage pregnancy. We talking about those type of things. We talking about drug treatment. We talk about mental health services. Put the money behind them so they can last more than a year. A year, because then you you really can't judge an organization. You can and you cannot really judge your organization by a year. I mean, you'd be like, well, I don't really see what y'all really doing, but ain't nothing but a year. You ain't even given enough time to marinate. You know, you just saying it from yours, but you're not saying what they out there in the streets really putting that work in. So giving them three to four million for three to well, how many years, but long as it's more than three years, about three years should be the lowest. <laughs> it should you. be no less than three years. <laughs> Um, so one of the things we, uh, we're really grateful for the answers and really in-depth picture that you've given for our questions, but we want to make sure to get a few audience questions in before we wrap up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine two of them and put it out to all three of you at once. So one is, since there's been a recent increase in violence in communities across the country that suggests larger systemic factors, probably national systemic factors, um, and sorry, that wasn't the one I was looking at. Um, so, uh, as a community activist, are you finding that city government is listening to you and providing support? Is city government expecting community activists to look more toward each other for resources and support instead? So that's one part of it. Are you feeling supported by city government, um, in your work? Is your work materially or in other ways supported by city government? But secondly, um, what do you see as the role and responsibility of law enforcement in your work and mission? Are they considered partners or obstacles? So um, two parts of a question about your relationship with city government and city police um, as an organization. If you could answer those two um, together, that would be great since we're running short on time. Okay, so... Um... Again, self-determination. So we are not seeking city government. Um, we are supported by city government. Um, they, they apply at all inclusive. So whatever they decide to do is, is fine. Um, if they do side, decide to participate, that's great. They, we, we have, like I said, we have been supported. Um, as far as law enforcement, um, again, they're welcome. Um, we are mindful about where we are. We're in Baltimore City where is um, police are not always welcome in all spaces. So um, there are times that um, we have to be, we just have to be conscious about that. Um, and because we're here to, for the community first. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, they, they do participate as well. Um, they um, are excited about Baltimore ceasefire, but there just are spaces that they may not be in because of um, the audience or whoever's um, participating. I mean, I'll basically say that very similar, which is uh, we the 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 city government is supportive of of the work that we do. Um, uh, resources are kind of caught up in bureaucracy um, to support us. Um, so we have commitments uh, to support the work that we do, uh, but it's caught up in bureaucracy. Um, so that's the unfortunate part. But again, 
uh, we won't stop the work that we're doing because of the bureaucracy. Because we we need we need uh, we we're out there to help save our people. Um, uh, the second part of the question was um, I know city government and what was the second part? Uh, the police, the role of the police, whether they're an obstacle or an aid to you. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is important. Uh, it, under the consent decree, uh, the inability, they kind of stayed away from engagement and being able to, to be the engaging partner was important for us to do that engagement part. One of the things that has uh, been, you know, during that time they were out, was it was kind of distance and not out of their cars and things like that, didn't have much of visual presence. I will say that we've been seeing more of a visual presence of the police department and the relation, we do have collaborative, uh, we, there's collaboration now um, that I think is important. Uh, collaboration meaning uh, uh, of, of what we need from them as well um, in the community. And they're always open to supporting us, but we kind of, uh, again, it's about trust uh, with the individuals that we're serving. So we don't, uh, uh, you know, we, we commit to, stopping the problem with no police involved um, and a lot of so where they don't where the community don't trust the police we get involved and kind of jump in so it's not a bad relationship but just some of the work requires us to have distance between the uh, us and the police so that we can then get into the real story and just understand there's always there are three stories it's the story that the news tell is the story that the police tell and it's the story that the community tells um, and, and you know, the community story is really the most important story because you get the in-depth of what's going on on the grassroots level, so, yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna start with the police department. Um, being in the streets, you know, which I am almost every day, you know, that's a, a bridge that has to be rebuilt. We see a lot of uh, positivity, but it ain't moving fast enough. You know, um, the trust is not really there. So when I'm out there doing um, gang violence or conflict resolution, I know that in, in a lot of them situations, I can't involve the police. It just ain't a good look for the community. And the community wouldn't even allow me to do that. I don't care who you say you are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just certain boundaries and certain codes and unspoken words that just goes on in, the, in, in all communities, right? So we got to rebuild that trust, right? And um, we're not saying that every uh, 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 police officer is bad because we do have some uh, police officers that I walk with and that I'm um, friends with, you know, you know, rather than the police department or the University of Maryland uh, police department, such as Parlo, MJ, but I know what I can call them on and I know what they're going to do. If I bring them around somebody, I pretty much know how that's going to plan out, not less, you know, uh, from some odd reasons, things go left. So that's a real uh, thin line, and that's 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 just a reality that we just dealing with right now. Not saying that it can't get better. That's just a thin line, and we gotta be very careful when we're trying to build, rebuild the trust of the community. You know, because then your life will be on the line. You know, and you know, all I think all three of us on the panel uh, understand that uh, you say or you do the wrong thing, and you involve the wrong people that you know you could definitely not just harm yourself or harm those around you and those that you love so uh when we talk we also got to deal in the reality aspect of it the reality aspect of it right that you gotta go back to the community once you're going to do something or once you bring okay. somebody in this is a community that you got your grassroots organization you walk around and you want to make sure that your word is born in trust Thank you so much, Mr. Sparks. We are coming down to the end of our evening, but we do want to offer our panelists um, an opportunity if you have any you know, closing thoughts or things that you wanna leave the audience with. Um, your expertise is so valued. Your partnership is valued and respected. So we'd love to give you an opportunity to close out. Um, and then we'll hear from Dr. Shadema. Uh, Ms. Jones, would you like to start us off? Sure. So um, I'm just going to encourage everybody to lead with your passion. Like your passion is going to show you where you need to be, how you need to do it. Um, and it, it's going to get you everywhere you need to be, like I said. So 
Uh, I'm speaking from my experience and just, just leave with your passion. It'll guide you everywhere you need to be. I'll just echo that as well as I think purpose and passion becomes important. Um, I am professionally also a special educator, which means they gave me a general certification, which means I can teach gifted and talented uh, all the way to all parts of the bell, bell curve. And I absolutely should not do it um, uh, because I know where my gifts and talents are. I think as a social worker, they give you a whole big scale um, that you can say, I'm, I can do everything. And I think uh, just like I, you wouldn't want a, a Mercedes working on a Cadillac dealer, I, I would figure out who I am, um, who you are as a social worker and master that and give that away to the world um, and be very good at saying that's not what I do, but I can recommend you to someone else. But what I do is this and be the best at what you do. So that would be my suggestion. <laughs> Um, before I get to all that, I would say that, uh, you know, we all blessed because some people ain't wake up the day to have a good or a bad day. And when you're going through it, you don't want to hear, but at least you got a chance to correct that wrong, right? And help somebody in their uh, struggle, their sojourn, right? Um, we make things harder than what it is. And I think that we need to do more partnering. I think that's key. Right, put your differences to the side, and not just like we was going to talk about the faith-based uh, communities. Right, you got a lot of organizations that's in the community that people don't even know there's in the community. I'd have been around people. They talk about you know that's such and such down the street. I be like, I've been living here all my whole life. Where they come from? So you got to come outside your doors. Everybody outside, take a look around and go and help. Nobody on the sidelines. We have no time right now for people on the sidelines. Everybody got to get in the fight. Stop talking, and if 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 you want if you if you got an answer, just hop in the fight. You know, become a volunteer. You know, do something. You know, something is better than nothing. Thanks. I had nothing. I I had nothing uh, real uh, educated and all that. Even though I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> now you go, Mr. Sparks. You always are spreading that wisdom and helping us all know exactly how to move in this world. Um. Thank you all so, so, so much, uh, Dr. Shadema. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to our panelists for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts with us. Um, and um, we're so appreciative to have you here. Um, I have put links to all of your organizations in the chat um, as people were asking questions so that I encourage anybody to please, you know, um, look at the organizations. Um, if you want theirs, contact us to reach out to our panelists. Thank everybody who came here as well for being interested, for wanting to hear. Um, this will be recorded um, so we can also share it with our students in the future. Um, and thank you to our facilitators. Uh, the Thurs lecture is a biannual lecture. Uh, we also co-sponsored with Roar, which um, Ms. Jones, you had mentioned, that is Rebuild, Overcome, and Rise Center, and our very own UMB uh, Bewell uh, Lab, and also the Collaborative is a co-sponsor, the Healing Center uh, community that, that Kyla is um, engaged with. So thank you all for being here. Um, please look out for our emails uh, in the future. There's also a link to Daniel Thurs. And again, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Like I said in the beginning, you know, we know what we know, um, and there's a lot we don't know. And um, so thank you for sharing your, your wisdom with us. <laughs>